Did you know that at some point in his life, Elon Musk was almost killed by his opponents at the United States Senate? In this episode of the Space Info podcast, we talk with Rick Tumblison, a renowned space visionary and entrepreneur, and he has played a pivotal role in shaping the commercial space industry. He is again also today an activist in the space field and with over 40 years of experience in the field well i welcome him on board now on the space info podcast welcome back on the space info podcast here we talk about space and everything related to it if you are passionate about space astronomy technology and everything about it you can join all our social platform at the space info club or our website at www.spaceinfo.club where tons of content and a community of experts are there waiting for you this is the space info club okay so welcome on board rick how are you hey i'm doing great sebastiano thank you for having me on Ah, uh, it's a great, great pleasure. So uh, for the people that maybe uh, don't know you, but uh, I think that there are very few. Uh, I, I just uh, I'm going to make a brief introduction that just let you talk uh, of whatever topic you, you'd like. And for the people that don't know Rick, he is a renowned, uh, renowned space visionary, also an entrepreneur, an advocate for human space exploration. And also he uh, founded uh, multiple uh, pioneer space initiatives as well as, uh, for example, the Space Frontier Foundation. And he has dedicated his career to opening space for humanity in general. And uh, with over three decades of experience, he played a pivotal role in shaping the commercial space industry. And uh, well, among his deeds, today we are talking about uh, our planet and the future of uh, humanity in uh, in space. So as, as I said, welcome aboard, Rick. And uh, maybe you'd like to tell us a little more about uh, how your journey started a few years ago. <laughs> oh, that could take forever. But um, I've been very lucky, uh, Sebastiano. I, I, uh, um, I've been around a lot of great people who were very visionary. And, um, you know, I, I grew up as one of that generation that watched the Apollo program. Um, some people call us the uh, Apollo's children. Some po- people call us the orphans of Apollo. In fact, there's a documentary. Yeah, I know. Watched <laughs> orphans of Apollo. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, we grew up with this idea that once we got to the moon, um, that things were going to keep going, um, that we were going to move, you know, like you and I, if we had gone the right, the way we believed it was going to go, you and I would be conducting this, like you might be on the moon. I I might be in a space habitat. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that's what everybody was thinking at the time. Uh, unfortunately, that wasn't the case in the sense of the people that had all the money, which was the government. Um, and so I got engaged in the, uh, let's call it the loyal opposition with Space Frontier Foundation. And we went head to head with the aerospace industrial complex for many years, um, pushing for a return to the moon, pushing for uh, private sector sort of practices, because we wanted the costs to come down so people could go up. And um, so in the 90s, we were, um, uh, at one point, we were pushing against the space station. And you may ask, well, why? And that was because we didn't believe the government should build buildings or trucks. That should be the private sector. The government should be doing the leading edge. Here in America, we had some famous explorers named Lewis and Clark. um, And that their job was to go out to the very edge and tell us what's there. And then the people follow. And so our feeling was that, Apollo, that program had been them doing that job, and then the people should follow. Um, And so during the 90s, we we had those battles. Um, In 1995, I testified in in Congress that all transportation to the to and from the space station should be uh, commercially provided and um, that the next space station should be commercial uh, after the original one. Um, and, uh, we took several years fighting for that, but eventually we were able to get the policies and laws changed that enabled this little company called SpaceX, uh, to start flying people to and from. Yeah. Maybe Uh, someone already heard about this little company, (laughs) little company. And then, uh, around 2000, uh, or in the late nineties, uh, I led a team with my friend, Walt Anderson, who was the, the, the gentleman with the money 
and we leased uh, the Russian Mir space station for about a year. Um, we lost that battle. Um, and um, basically, we were taken out because, again, we were trying to open a little... <laughs> a little private motel, let's say. <laughs> and the government and its partners, Russian and American, Soviet and American at that point, um, were, were trying to, or Russian and American, I should say, um, were trying to create this big facility. And so we were kind of a threat to them. But what came out of that was I had signed up a gentleman to fly named Dennis Tito. Um, and then we were able to move him to the space station, International Space Station. And he became the first person to buy a, a ticket to go there. Um, and so moving along in time, um, again, some more Washington stuff. I have constantly during this whole period of time, you can go back and look at my writings where I'm constantly engaging uh, with the government um, and, and trying to say, hey, come on, you know, let's 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 transform uh, this thing. Uh, and then eventually um, co-founded one of the, or I founded the first uh, asteroid mining company, uh, or one of the two. And um, my friend, Peter Diamandis, um, I had been on his board of directors for a thing called the X Prize. Mm -hmm. And so he founded the other one. Um, they were called Planetary Resources. Mine was called Deep Space Industries. We were too early, uh, obviously. And uh, but however, uh, I'm proud of both companies because we were able to change the conversation again. Yeah. Where space resources is now a serious thing. Um, in between then, uh, I, I had a little spacesuit company um, uh, again too early. We had launched it right after the X Prize, thinking that there were going to be a bunch of commercial uh, spaceflight participants is the name that we came okay. up with. I worked with I worked with NASA on that and and of course they came up with the the biggest longest name they could right space flight participant <laughs> um i call them commercial astronauts or private astronauts okay um and um so then um moving along uh the asteroid company i decided i'd been on the side of the com on the table asking for money so long so i started to get on the side of the table giving money uh, or investing, and I founded a, a venture capital company called Space Fund. Um, and Space Fund right now um, has 21 startups under management, only about 20 million in there. Uh, the company is now raising 100 million to go into a bigger, you know, a bigger portfolio. Um, I stepped away from the company uh, in January to let them do it. Uh, it's kind of a startup person thing, you know. I okay. now it's all about. Now it's all about spreadsheets and, and all of that, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I okay, right. but yeah, I, I think that we can uh, let's say deduct this fact from uh, from what you are saying, uh, yeah. l launching uh, companies and things like that, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, yeah. please go on. No, no, it, and so you know, it, and I have to say, it was fun picking out twenty company or twenty one companies. That was fun, right? And 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 um, they're all alive which is great. We have 21 out of 21 are still operating, which is very rare for venture capital. Yeah, sure. Um, and also for the fact that they are space startups. So we do you know, two, two different yeah. things. The, the fact that they are startups and also that they are in the space field, something which Absolutely. is very, very new and very innovative. So the risk is higher. Absolutely. Uh, I remember having a conversation um, about the word new. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how that translates in Italian, but the, the word new. And if you have the word new too many times in the description of the company, it's a new industry, a new company, you know, a new idea, a new technology, a new team, and a new investment. It's that's too many words, too many times, right? Okay. You need to get that down to, you know, very minimal, uh, like a new idea in a new industry. That's good, right? And then, you know, you have to... Uh, work that, but that gets into the whole venture capital thing. Um, so then um, along the way, I had started an organization called the Earthlight Foundation. And for about seven years, Earthlight Foundation has been throwing uh, a conference called New Worlds and a party called the Space Cowboy Ball. Um, but the Earthlight Foundation um, is focused on sort of the um, the why we go. Mm -hmm. and who we are when we go um and you know the and from that you get the how 
But my bottom line, and, and, and I left out one of the most important things, is before I got into all of this, um, I had started a, a space society in, in uh, New York City and uh, ended up volunteering and then eventually working for a guy named Gerard K. O'Neill. And your listeners must know, and they must, this is a, your homework assignment is to go get The High Frontier by Gerard K. O'Neill. Um, okay. And there is a documentary on Apple, by the way. Um, the High Frontier is the the book that started it all. Um, everything you see, Elon, Jeff, Bezos, all of that goes back to the high frontier. Um, and even, even if Elon doesn't admit it, if it hadn't been for groups that came from the high frontier, there'd be no SpaceX today. Um, you know, and, um, because we were the ones holding the line. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Maybe I've heard, heard about this associated to Tom Mueller. Is it possible? Tom Mueller? Yeah, the, the former CTO of, um, of SpaceX. Oh, no, Tom Mueller. Oh, yes. No, no. Um, he may have mentioned it. The, um, But again, the um, we had such a belief in what came from... So let me jump back. The High Frontier mm -hmm. is a book that was written in the 70s. Dr. O'Neill was actually on the way to being no, uh, nominated for a Nobel Prize. Okay. And whenever you hear about the, you know, the super colliders, the atomic super colliders, and the fact that they're big circles, mm -hmm. he's the guy that figured out how to bend them so they didn't have to be a straight line. Okay. Right. And he was about to get, he was a Princeton professor and he was about to get a Nobel Prize. He was ready for that. Um, now, at the time, you have to understand the period of time. Apollo was ending. Um, there were riots, there were all kinds of things happening, discontent, sounds familiar. Um, and then um, there was also a big environmental movement, sound familiar? <laughs> and what he did was he came up with this idea when he worked with his students, of like how to engage them. And the idea was, is the planet, is the surface of a planet the best place to grow Um you know, a civilization. And his answer was no. And so what he did in the high frontier was he came up with this idea. Now the word isn't appropriate now, but they were called space colonies back then. I call mm -hmm. them space communities, space habitats. Um, and they're just rotating facilities in space that give you variable gravity. So basically you would have one gravity. So a person growing up in one of these big rotating facilities could easily come back and forth to the earth as opposed mm -hmm. to Mars, which is one third gravity or the moon, which is one sixth gravity. Um, and so Dr. O'Neill put this book together and said all of this, but what he also did, which was very important, he made it so that it was regular people. It was one of the first times anybody had said that folks like you and I and your listeners could lead the way. In fact, one of the main characters in, a, in the book to kind of get it started, the narrative, is a little girl mm -hmm. who's growing up in one of these habitats writing a letter about how her family you know, lives and works up there. And they, had, they were doing space solar power satellites was their uh, revenue source to build their community. And people like me, I was a terrible student. I was a, I was a bad boy. I just was in school. I was on the bad side of things, but I was reading tons of science fiction. I read and actually got to meet Arthur C. Clarke, Isaac Asimov, Robert Heinlein uh, later. Uh, but I was reading their books. I had this dream of going. In fact, uh, I use the term now permission to dream. Okay. Uh, I read their books and that allowed me to give myself permission to dream. Permission to dream is a thing we each give ourselves that nobody else can take away but us. It's our own permission. So I had that permission in my head, but I didn't know what to do with it. And I'll just give you a quick short story here that um, sure. I'm giving you long answers, I know. But um, I had, like I said, I was a terrible student. I walked out of my classes because I always thought I was smarter than my prof professors. 
all of that. I ended up working, uh, I was doing tech in, in the theater department um, at one point too. But a, a couple of months before, this is when I first heard of Dr. O'Neill. Um, I was sitting in the uh, student lounge, stoned, um, and watching this guy named Timothy Leary giving a speech about this new idea that this guy, Dr. O'Neill, had of, of building these communities in space. And I was, it just hit me. It was like, oh my God, that's it. I want to do that. But again, I was a terrible student. So a few months later, I'm working in the, the tech at the, at the theater department um, and I'm backstage and they had a guest speaker and his name was Gene Roddenberry. He was the guy who created Star Trek. And so there's this beautiful moment that, and I've talked to his son, I know his son very well, um, where we're backstage and I'm putting his microphone and doing all this and we're alone. And I said, Mr. Roddenberry, I am a huge fan of Star Trek. And I've, have you heard of this Dr. O'Neill? And he's like, yeah, I've heard of all that. I said, I want to make it happen, but I'm a terrible student and I just don't think I'm ever going to be able to do it. And he said, look, and I'm kind of paraphrasing, but he said, look, stay with your dream. No matter what you do, stay with your dream, make it happen. Never give up. And I, and I, I kind of argued with him a little bit or, you know, had a discussion. I said, I, I'm such a bad student. I mean, what, how can I get from this to that? He said, and he stopped me and he said, you know what I used to do before Star Trek? I said, no, what? He said, I was a Los Angeles police officer. And I used to drive around in my black and white police car with my script for Star Trek laying on the seat next to me. And then during lunches and things like that, I would go to the studio and try and get them to buy the show. You know, those shows, there were several along the way. And he said, if I can do that, you can do anything you want. You just have to stay on it. And it changed my life. So again, going back, following that, end up in New York. Here I am. Uh, I meet Dr. O'Neill. I volunteered. And I said, I will sweep the floors. I'll do anything. Just let me in. And he did. And then eventually I worked my way up to a paid position. Um, meanwhile, started doing the political activities in Washington. Um, and then it kind of went from there and I got to be known in a certain way, built up the Space Frontier Foundation and, uh, off we went. And so now I'm coming full circle, um, because it was kind of freeing. I didn't have to, uh, at that point, you know, I wasn't working for a company or anything like that. So I've freed myself again now. Mm -hmm. And your listeners, uh, if they pay attention to space, they'll be hearing more from me in the future. I'm going to be bringing up different topics, which we can talk about in a minute if you want. Um, but really, um, what I've learned underneath all of this, and it, it's going to be in my book, which I'll be coming out with next year. Um, we can also talk about that later. It's called Why Space? The Purpose okay. People. Um, but what I realized was for all these years, that I've been in this cause, um, like many of my my peers and the friends of mine who've started companies and such, we're always trying to sell space to the public. You know, the, the, how do we convince, you know, other people? Probably not your listeners. They're, they're probably listening to you because they're already in. Yeah, they're probably, already, yes, I think so. You know, me, yeah, me already, I am the first. <laughs> yeah, they've already drunk the Kool-Aid they're in and like, oh, Sebastiano got me, you know, I'm in, let's go. <laughs> But uh, people out there in the world trying to explain to them, and we always use all these different things. Uh, well, you know, it's going to help life here on Earth. It's going to help the environment, um, space resources, on and on and on, right? Jobs, um, all of these things. Those are all true. But as I took time over the last few years to, to look at it, and I, I had a, a, a beautiful experience several years ago when my mother passed away. And um, where I, I just had one of those moments, you know, and I've realized that we need to touch people's soul. We need to, to speak to their, to their hearts and souls. And especially now, you know, so I, I, especially I, at this moment in time, 
probably one of the most important moment in, moments in time in, in human history, maybe the history of life itself. Because we've gotten to a point where, and I, and I like to point out that I believe this is, that we're ending the most important hundred years. So if you look back to the 30s and 40s, let's say, um, it was during that time that we had the first war in, in the 20s, you know, roughly around 40 years ago or a hundred years ago. Um, and we had the first world war. We had the first global epidemic. We had the first global communications in the form of radio and TV. Um, we had the first global ability to travel. Um, we had the technologies of rockets. Um, the first computers started showing up in that period. All of these things that have now shaped that end of that century and the beginning of this one are climaxing at the same point that our more um, animal-like tendencies are more, um, you know, we're very selfish creatures um, where we have, since the dawn of civilization, the expansion of humanity has always been characterized by an attack on the environment. Like as we grow, the natural world gets pushed away. Yeah. All of this is kind of coming together now. All these different trends, all of these different things coming together right now. We're on the verge. You know, we have, we actually have world leaders, a couple of them talking about nuclear war. Right. Um, we have fragmentation in our society where people are getting into the, the electronic world and going into narrower and narrower and narrower places. Um, this, you know, people are getting all their news from certain certain very narrow silos. Um, all of these things are happening. And um, at that very moment, though, isn't it interesting that we have the very first rocket ships? Uh, by the way, I use the word rocket ships very carefully. I'm, I'm working on a piece where I explain this. I call rocket ships rocket ships because you don't throw ships away. Yeah. Right? You might throw a rocket away. You might throw a launcher away, but you don't throw a ship away. So rocket ships, which is the reusable space transportation systems. So we've got Elon and Jeff. We've got my friend Peter Beck with Rocket Lab. Uh, Firefly is working on reusables. Our friends in China are working on reusables. They're all working on rocket ships. So now... We're hitting this moment in time where if we don't destroy ourselves and we're able to get these, these ships flying, humanity and life, the life that we've been attacking all of this time, can break loose into the universe for the first time. And I'll end with this and then we could talk. I, I know I've been going long on the no, question. No problem. Um, my friends will tell you, you know, just ask Rick a question and sit back. You know, so, uh, but we are at this moment where for the first time, everything gets reversed. So rather than the expansion of our technology killing life, we get to use it to carry life to places that are yeah. now dead. You know, um, rather than taking places from people who were already there, we get to go together for the first time. Um, you know, this this is transformational. And so Earth Light Foundation, my book, a lot of my work now, probably from here on, is going to be spreading that message to people, uh, especially the people in the field, especially my my friends and associates in the space field that we have a mission, that we have a job to do. Um, and what's beautiful about it, Sebastiano, is if you adopt this philosophy, it just happens to line up with reusing things, recycling, circular economy. You know, you don't throw things away. You, you shouldn't in space. Everything is precious. Every piece of life is precious. Everything you use is precious. And you find something else to do with it. So... You know that's where I am. Yeah, I, I actually, 
Well, one of the, I, I got many hints, but while you were talking, talking and I had, okay, I have to ask him this, ask him that. So I will start from, from the very end because, uh, well, when you're talking about the mission of uh, the the New Worlds Foundation and all what you do, uh, well, I, I I I thought okay, that that's why the Space Info Club is existing today, and that's also very aligned with the, with my my thought basically. So I say okay, we did education is one of the little pieces that you have to put together to let people know. And well, I don't really like people saying okay, this is good for us. Uh, because I am saying this or because some kind of mysterious data are telling to you. But just just look out and you will see by yourself that this kind of approach is the best one, is the way to go. And uh, uh, also while you were talking, uh, the, uh, well, the topic of expansion and bringing uh, life on other planets, on, on let's say other bodies, uh, is uh, a very new concept uh, because as you were saying that it's the very first time that we are going to bring something that exists here to an, another place in the in the universe, and we never did it. But uh, I would like to talk a little more about what you were saying about what happened. Well, uh, one one century ago, we had a very a lot of revolutions in different fields that uh, helped us being here today, uh, doing what we are doing. But well, I, I would I would see this let's say this path in a more of a, let's say in a inductive way so we start from uh, from the bottom and we end up in the, in the climax we are today but shouldn't we try to get from this kind of climax back to the some sort of origins to start new lives elsewhere well uh, for example we mentioned the the rocket ships the new technology but shouldn't we sort of revert this path starting from the rockets and then uh, going back, let's say, from the agriculture to start new lives. Yeah, I, I... Uh, what, what do you think? Wait a minute. Well, before going on, I'm very proud to let you know that the Space Info Club is the official media partner of the New Worlds event. Well, also, the Cowboy and Cowgirl Award winners of this year have been announced and will be presented at the event the 1st and the 2nd of November in Houston. I can tell you that the Spouse Space Cowgirl Award goes to Vanessa Weiss, the director of the Johnson Space Center. We are very proud to present Vanessa for this award. Her remarkable career at NASA, culminating as the first African-American woman to lead the Space Center, has been defined by tireless efforts to inspire and motivate young people from all backgrounds to pursue a career in STEM. And then the Space Cowboy Award goes to Cam Gaffarin, Houston Space Investor. Well, Cam embodies the visionary leadership that drives the future, and he helped elevate Axiom Space into a commercial space leader and also funded Intuitive Machine. Well, I think that uh, you have heard about these two companies, and particularly about Intuitive Machines, which is the first private company to land on the moon. And also, you will see a lot of other events at the New Worlds to this year, the 1st and the 2nd of November in Houston, Texas. You can get your tickets on the website by clicking in the link below, which is an affiliation link between the Space Info Club and the New Worlds event. We are very proud to partner with this event. Being a media partner with them is an honor, and we are very happy to share this event with you. Let me know in the comments what you think, and also if you take part of this event so we can meet them. Thanks, and now back to the video. Yeah, help me help me understand a little bit more what you're asking me. I, I'm 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 not quite 100 percent clear on, on on the question. Yeah, so. because uh, what well, you 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 uh, it seems that we uh, so far we have looked at let's say historical path. Let's say in the yeah in, in, as as years go on. So mm -hmm. uh, we started from agriculture, then we had the industrial revolution in the uh, sure. 19th century, and then half century ago we had uh, aviation, rocket ships, and things like that. But if we have to let's say bring life. For example, uh, on the moon, for example, we should start by the uh, industrialization, the production of things in situ, or maybe uh, trying to, let's say, uh, exploit agriculture over there. So it seems that we are going, uh, sort of going back yes. with, uh, yeah. okay. with the yeah. technology. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting because I think that there's something beautiful about it in a way, because mm -hmm. we're, in a way, we're getting back to our, um, to the roots uh, almost before agriculture, 
um, that the the ability, like in a few decades, potentially, there are going to be people living in space if we're successful. Yeah. There'll be small groups, tribes, communities living in space who really don't need to interact with the earth anymore. They're going to be, um, they'll be independent. And it's not, maybe it's not quite like, you know, in Star Trek where you say, uh, you know, give me my, my, you know, my favorite lasagna and there it is, you know, and, and all of that. And it makes it for you. But if you think about it, they're going to have additive manufacturing. They're going to have their own agriculture on board, whatever it is they're living in. They're going to be able to use space resources. They're going to have unlimited energy. And, and so they're going to be reestablishing the idea of community and, and tribe um, and being able to, to work at a very basic level, establishing those bonds. One of the things that's happened is um, we've lost a lot, not totally, but we've lost a lot of the uh, connections we have with each other, for example. Um, I like talking about the fact that, you know, there, there's one place in the solar system where Russians and Americans don't just live together, but they love each other, you know, and it's right up there. Yep. Right. If we can provide all of those great examples of how to be. Um, and, but we have to transform the way that the traditional space programs, ESA, NASA, uh, JAXA, China, ISRO, all of the different company uh, entities operate because they're still operating in an early 20th century mode of throwing everything away. You know, that's that's the characteristic that I can't stand. Um, you know, um, and and so we we've got to to take ourselves back to a, a level of being close. I, and, and I know it sounds ironic to some people because we're talking about space, rocket ships and spaceships, and I'm saying being close to nature, right? Because we're going to be going out as sort of the seed carriers of yeah. life. You know, we're the seed carriers. If Earth is Gaia, you know, the mother world. I, I always call it the mother world, by the mm -hmm. way. And so if this mother world um, uh, has produced us and we've been a bad child. Speaking of my bad childhood, you know, we've been a pretty bad child. I mean, you know, um, that's true. <laughs> and she's given us everything we could ever want. What have we done in return? We sort of trashed the house, right? Um, and and abused her and all of this. So we have to do these two things at once. We have to save the earth. And by the way, nothing I am saying here is about abandoning Earth. Not at all. In fact, we're almost sort of out environmentaling the environmental movement because the environmental movement is is great you know i i used to right out of college i did some stuff for greenpeace you know i'm a tree hugger um you know my, my porch is full of baby trees that i'm growing i'm going to take out and plant I'm, I'm very much into it i love it there's nothing greater than watching something that looks like a pebble turn into a plant or a tree. I mean, it's amazing. Um, and so I'm totally for that, but we have to um, go beyond that here on this planet. Um, you know, it's almost the difference between, and look, it, it's my generation and generations before us that have handed your generation and generations after you this mess. You know, we've screwed everything up. You know, because we've been operating almost with the minds of apes, right? We, we've been just kind of driving through everything, burning it all up, using it, just take it all, let's go, right? With no understanding that we're actually already in a spaceship that has limits, yeah, right? And, you know, it's the biggest spaceship of all, you know, but it's still a spaceship and what, <laughs> um, I was laughing because there's this old commercial here about Las Vegas, and they used to say, "What's what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas." You know, <laughs> well, what happens on the Earth is we're stuck with yeah. on the Earth. Yeah, right? it stays with the Earth. Right. So as we step out there, the question for us is: Are we going to step out there in this sort of ape-like 
uh, animal-like, take-it-all-and-don't-care fashion? Or are we going to use this to raise ourselves up another notch and become better humans, better stewards of the life of this planet? Um the uh, I'll give you the principles that are they're in the book, but they're also the Earthlight principles. Um, number one is to protect and expand the domain of life, um, and that means not just saving the mother world, but carrying her seeds to places now dead, which I've said before. Number two is to honor and evolve human civilization. What does that mean? That means I honor where you came from. I honor your story. You know, whether you're here in, I, I live in Texas, whether you're one of the first people, you know, that was here or the people who came later, whether you were enslaved, whether you're a conqueror, whatever it was, I honor, I honor all of your stories and we weave them together into this tapestry um, that gave us comfort as, as, as we grew. And then the second part is to honor and evolve. So as we go into space, how can we evolve? How can we use this moment to become better humans? Right? I don't want to go out there. I don't know if your 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 viewers watched the series The Expanse. I've um, watched it. Yeah. Yeah, I have some friends that are were in it, and and we gave them an award at one of our conferences. It's great, but that's that's not how I want humans to be. Mm. Right? Because it's basically just a repeat. It's the same thing. It's just done in space, right? We've got these folks and they're being enslaved. They call them the belters, you know, and you've got the the Spartans, which is the Martian people, and they're over there. And then you've got the, it's, we have a chance to do things differently. Yeah, but that, that's also the, what what people want to see in, in that yeah, case. Yeah, it makes probably, sense. Probably that wouldn't be a good reality. Wouldn't be a great reality. It's understandable. Um, It's cool. And it was a lot of fun. Loved it. Uh, great technology. At least they had gravity. You know, mm -hmm. they paid attention to gravity and things like that. Um, but going back to Mr. Roddenberry, Star Trek. Now that gets towards where I want to go. Where I want to see this, this community of people. And, and so we evolve humanity as we go into space. That's the second part of the principle. And by the way, I also mean physically. You know, we may have to evolve new species of humans on the moon. I call them Homo lunaris on Mars, Homo marzialis in space, Homo spatialis. Um, these are new species of humans that are adapted to one six gravity, high levels of radiation, enclosed spaces, the ability to deal with like on the moon, the dust, which is terrible. Most people don't, you know, we get romantic and we forget that, Moon dust, for example, um, the Apollo missions, if they had stayed on the moon much longer, they might not have been able to come back because yeah. the moon dust was getting into everything. And moon dust, for those who, who don't know it, is, I call it razor blade talcum powder. It's like the powder you put on your face. Mm -hmm. But imagine if that was all little tiny razor blades because it doesn't have erosion to make it all round and soft, right? It's, yeah. it's sharp. It's forever sharp, right? On Mars, we have different perchlorates and things like that in the surface. We have to pay attention to these, but these new parts of humanity will be used to that. And they'll be, they'll, they'll be, and homo spatialis, you can have two kinds. You can have human beings or derived from human beings that live in microgravity. These might be people who eventually do without legs 